Okay, here we go. Yet another daf in your Hashem. Tonight we're going to be learning Masecha Shabbos Daf Kuf Chaf Gimel. Um, tonight we will be unearthing some of the background of one of the most prevalent aspects of the world of Muksa, as it's referred to, which is Klisha Malach to Le Isser, Klisha Malach to Le And uh, let's say, for example, someone wants to use a, uh, a hammer. Can you? Can you use a hammer to, uh, for a mutter function? Obviously, you can't use a hammer for an usser function, but can you use it for a mutter function? So these are, um, that's just a sampling of many different types of questions that we could ask, and Amir Tashem will get to the, to the background on all of them. We're starting tonight, as Mark kindly indicated, on the bottom of Kufcha Bez and Bez at the two dots, about eight lines from the bottom. We had quoted in our Mishnah in the very beginning of Perikol uh, HaKelim that one is, if you look just up in the Mishnah for a moment, we said in the third line of the Mishnah, Notel Adam Kornas Lefatsea Boesai Gozim. You're allowed to take a hammer in order to crack open some, some nuts, some walnuts. So it says the Gemara as follows, going to the bottom. Notel Adam Kornas, Amar Rav Yehuda, you're allowed to take a hammer that's dedicated to the purpose of opening walnuts, of opening nuts. That's what you're allowed to use. Aval, lo, aval shal lo. But if it's going to be that of a uh, someone who works with a hammer for uh, uh, something, let's say, to hammer out metal, to hammer nails, the hammer from the basement that we typically have, that's not allowed, says Rabbi Huda. So says the Gemara Kasavar. What does that indicate that Rabbi Huda holds? Okay, this is Rabbi Huda. Um, one of the Amoraim, not, not the Tana, it's Rav Yehuda. Kasavar, Dvar Shemalachto, Le Iser, Afilu, Le Tzorach, Kufo, Aser. He held, not like we hold, he held that if you have a Kli that is Malachto, Le Iser, as is a hammer, so then even when you're using it, Le Tzorach, Kufo, even when you need it for something that's Mutter, the Din is, says Rav Yehuda, Aser. Omar Le Rabba, if that's true, what about the rest of the Mishnah? We just learned at the top of the page. Amar, Amar Le Rabba, Elamiyata, if that's true, Seifa, at the end of the Mishnah, we taught a din, the Katani, Ves Harachas, Ves Hamalz, Ves Hamalgez, La Seisa Lav Katan. We said that you can feed a child. Remember the context I shared last night is that, let's say you haven't yet washed the Tila Sedayim and you want to feed your child. So you, you indirectly, you take something that's, it's a Klisha Malach to Leisar, to use for, for, for moving uh, hay around, it's a pitchfork of some kind, you're using it to feed your child. So isn't that this case? It's Klisha Malach to Leisar, yet we see it's Mutter. Rabbi Yehuda, where do you get your shita from? After all, uh, that's not the types of spoons that, and forks that we give to children. That's ridiculous. So obviously, it says the, uh, the dissenting opinion, obviously it says Rabbah, we see that a Klisha Malach to Leisar, but uh, you're using it for a mutter purpose, it should be mutter. So how can you say that it's Asr, Rabbi Yehuda? It says the Gemara, El Amar Rabbah, therefore he gives his own answer. What we are talking about in our Mishnah is not a hammer that's specified for use for walnuts. Rather, we're using a hammer that is specified for use of anything, and it can be repurposed, even on Shabbos, for something that is mutter. That is called kli shemalachto le'iser, le'tzorech gufo, and it should be mutter. Kasavar, this exact line. Davar shemalachto le'iser, you have something that really, a hammer that's used to, as uh, used to hammer in nails, it's really a kli shemalachto le'iser. However, le'tzorech gufo mutter. And that brings us to the top of Kuchav Gimel, Amud Aleph, and that's the Shita of Rabba. Eisi Abai le Rabba. Abai brings a question against Rabba's Shita. Remember with the, the line right above us, what does he say? Akli Shemalach to Le'isr, Le'tzorach Gufo is Mutter. Hold on one second. Meducha, this was something in which they would crush items, on which they would crush items. Meducha, im yesh bashum, im yesh bashum, if there's garlic that's still there that you crushed on it, the din is metal to lenosa, or the im lav ain't metal to lenosa. What do we see from here? That the only time it's mutter to be in the talta, the meducha, is when there's still garlic on it. But Rabbah, if you're right, that a klisha malachto le'iser, that's being used le'tzorech gufo, is mutter, so why is it dependent on whether or not there's shum there? I don't care if there's garlic there. It's a klisha malachto le'iser, le'tzorech gufo, and you, on the very top line of this page, wrote the word mutter. So this case doesn't work with you. Amarle, fourth line, Kufchav Kim Lamed Aleph. Amarle, how money? Who is this uh, source in the Tanoim like? This is the opinion of Rav Nechemya. Rav Nechemya had a more extreme opinion than, uh, than the others among the Tanoim. What did he hold? A shita that we saw earlier and that we will see again. To Amar, Ein Kli Nital Elo Letzorach Tashmisho. He had a general din that on Shabbos, you could only use a Kli for its intended purpose across the boards. And that would disable this whole model of using a Kli Shemalach to for any purpose.
works. Um, and this even, of course, for, uh, for a permissible one. And therefore, that's the sheet of Rav Nechemia. But Rabba doesn't hold like Rav Nechemia. Rabba holds like the other Tamim. ACV, another question is asked in the Gemara, skipping the parentheses, the Shavin, everyone agrees, Beisel, Beishamai both agree uh, that she love basar she'asr letalto. This was a, like a cutting block, but a large one. And what they would do is they would cut meat on it and they would take the big, uh, you know, the square cleaver type of cut and they'd hit very hard on it. It was a big piece of wood, whatever it was made out of. And there we said that after you cut on it, that it's asr letalto. But why? Why should it be asr? If Rabba holds that a davar shemalachto le'isr le'zorach kufo is mutter, that's this. It's a davar shemalachto le'isr. You're using it for good reasons. You're cutting meat and it's on yantif, which is the case here. So it's mutter to cut on yantif. Why then does it become muksa? Answers the Gemara. Savar the shenuye like Rav Nechemia. They wanted to give the same answer as before, namely that this is like Rav Nechemia, who holds what was his language. His language was that he held. Where's the line? No. Oh, ain clean nital ella l'torach tashmisha that you can only use a kli for its own purpose. We wanted to give that answer, but kevan de shama la shama la ha de amar of chinen of our shalom yom mishmei de rab hakol modim b'sichei zayri umezure that by these three types of utensils that are used uh, by weavers, um, or they're part of the dyeing process, but there are three. Um, they're very unique and potentially expensive utensils. And since those were not allowed to be used because of their expensive nature, the cave and the kapit alayhu, because we're so makbed about them, miyached luhu makom, and therefore we made these things miyuchad, and therefore you cannot use them under any circumstances. Hachanami, here too, in regards to this block of wood, it's, it's a dover miyuchad, miyached luhu makom. That's why in that particular case, we said that we would not apply Rabba's rule of Davar Shemalach to Lesser, the Torah Kufo is Mutter, because there it had a special din. And maybe, maybe, as some of the Rishonim entertain, this is where we see the idea of something called Muksa Machmas Chesron Kis, something that is Muksa because it's so expensive. Um, maybe uh, a lot of our technological devices are like that. Uh, maybe uh, anything that's expensive that you wouldn't want to break. You have a very expensive uh, dish that you got from uh, as an artifact. It's a, it's a, it's a family heirloom. So maybe that's muksa mach mas kis. Maybe that's what's being meramish. Itmar about a quarter of the way down. Itmar Rav Chia bar Abba Amar Rav Yochanan Korna Shel Zahavim Shanim. The Gemara now is going back to our mission and saying, okay. We had the machlokas between Rabbi Huda and Raba as to whether or not the Mishnah was talking about a hammer that's dedicated to be used for breaking open nuts or a hammer in general. And now we have still further qualifications of this hammer, obviously of much discussion. So Rabbi Yochanan is of the opinion of Korno Shel Zahavim Shaninim. The hammer that we were talking about was one within the camp of Rabba, namely it's one that's not dedicated to, to be breaking open nuts only. What does this do? This is meant to hammer out metal. Okay, that's what he says. Rav Shemin bar Abba Amar Kona Shel Besamin. This what Shaninu? No, it's not meant to hammer out metal. It's meant to hammer out Besamin. As we will see shortly, the one for the Besamin was more miyuchad, was more uh, was more particular, more was more unique. Says the Gemara, Ma de Amar de Besamin Kol Shekain de Zahavim. The one who says that you're allowed to use a hammer that's meant to hammer out uh, Besamin. That's kol shekain, all the more so dizahavim. All the more so you could use the hammer that's used to, uh, to hit the, and to flatten out metal. However, man to amr shel zahavim, the one who, who says that you're allowed to use the hammer, that the hammer of our mission is talking about one that is used to hammer metal, to hammer gold, about the besamim kapit Maybe one could argue that because the uniqueness of the hammer for besamim is greater than that of the one which is used for hitting out metal, one might have assumed that by besamim were more makbed and it's therefore not allowed. That brings us to the two dots, one third of the way down, kuf chav kimel Let's continue. Vesakush vesakarkar. We pointed out that these are devices that are normally used for weaving, and you can kind of poke them through as skewers or as toothpicks into food. Tanu Rabbanon, Paga, if you have an unripe uh, type of uh, fig, Shetamna B'Tevin, and you, you, you are like kind of hiding it inside Tevin, which is Muksa, which is like a random hay that's Muksa. Becharara Shetamana B'Gechalim, and you have some type of baked good that was hid inside of coals. It's already cooked, so there's no problem official here. 
If a piece of what you hid in the ground is sticking out, you can just reach in and grab that item. And it's going to move things around it, but no problem at all. You're allowed to reach in, and that will not be considered a violation of muksa. But if it's not visible from the surface, if you put it in too low, the fig, the, 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 the paga, too deep into the tevin, or the harara, too deep into the coals, so then the din is that it's, it's considered usr uh, letaltala, you're not allowed. That's one shita in the tanoim here. And uh, one shita in, uh, and this is a Gemara quoted in Erevin. And then the machlokes here is that of Rav Elazar ben Tadoi. Omer, no. What do you do to get these things out? You use something else. You don't use your hands. Toch ben bekush o bekarkar. You take one of these weaver types of pointy items. Behein minaros me'alein. And then you can poke out the item that you want. And then uh, things will fall on the sides. But no problem. Everything is fine. That's, that's still considered okay. Omar of Nachman. Or of Nachman says, I hold like that opinion. Halacha kribalazer ben tadai. So asks the Gemara, the Mamer, that seems to imply if Rav Nachman holds like the sheet of Rav Lazar ben Tadoi, what does it imply? The Mamra, the Savar Rav Nachman, Tilto Minatzad, Loshmi Tilto, that he holds that when you use this weaver's pick to move things out of the way, that that's, that's Tilto Minatzad, that it's Lav Shmei Tilto. But says the Gemara, how can Rav Nachman hold the Tilto Min Hatzad with this uh, weaver's pick is, con- is not considered muksa? After all, Ya'amar Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman said, Hai Kugla, this radish that you put in the ground, so if it's I- inverted when it's in the ground, such that the wider part, Milamala Lamata, the wider part is on top, then Shari, then you're allowed to pull it out of the ground. However, Mimata Lamala, if it's inverted where the thin part is by the surface, so then you can't really get it out, you can't reach it. Maybe it will see it. You can't reach it. So that doesn't work because then it seems to imply uh, that he doesn't hold like the opinion of Rabbi Lazar ben Tadai that you could use a weaver's pick. It's seemingly only if you can grasp it by your hand when the radish is inverted and you can reach it barehanded. Therefore, the Gemara backtracks. Hadar Bey Rav Nachman Nuihahi. Rav Nachman retracted his opinion that we hold like Rabbi Lazar ben Tadai. And therefore, it seems from the Gemara itself that Rav Nachman would fall back on the sheet of the Chachamim that if you can gain access to it barehandedly, you're allowed to pull it out. If not, not. Continues the Gemara halfway down. Machat shel yad little ba coats. You're allowed to take a needle in order to pull out a thorn. Shalach le rabba bere de rabba le rav Yosef yilam denu rabbeinu. Rava, the son of Rava, sent to rav Yosef, Rebbe, teach us Torah. Machat, let's say I have a needle. Shenitz al charora o okta, where the eye of the needle broke off or the pointy part of the needle broke off. Mahu, what is the din in regards to using it to remove a, uh, to remove a, um, no, uh, to remove a splinter? Amar lei, tiny two, we learned this already. Machat shel ya, li told boyas hakot. Any type of needle is going to be fine. And asks the Gemara rhetorically, v'chima ichpas lei lakot. What does the thorn care? Bein nekuva, levein she'en on nekuva. What does the, what does the splinter in your hand care if the eye is missing on the needle? I don't care. As long as I can get this out, as long as I can get the splinter out, it should work just fine. So it says that's, our, again, in rhetorical mind, it seems to be that it's perfectly permissible to use this even if it breaks. So it asks the Gemara, but if that's true, Asive says the Gemara, Machat Shnitzel Charoro Tahora. We see in regards to the world of Tuma Vitara that if a needle breaks such that the eye falls off or that the, the sharp part falls off, we see in this Mishnah that it's Tahora, that it's no longer Tahor, namely, it's not a Kli. If it's not a Kli, then we have no Heterim to use it on Shabbos, to even to remove a coat, even to remove a splinter. So that doesn't work. You just said that even if it doesn't have an eyelet, it can be used. But this, this source in the Tanaim says that's not true because it has no din of being a Kli Bichlam. Answers the Gemara, two answers. Amar Abaye, Abaye asks, come on, Tuma Ashabis Karamis. We've, we've spoken about this many times, yesterday as well, and in many, many blood and prior. We often see comparisons where the Gemara is trying to learn from the world of Shabbos to, to another world or vice versa. Now, we're looking at the world of Tuma Vitara and saying, are we able to extrapolate from the world of Tuma Vitara back to Shabbos? So says the Gemara in the name of Abaye, what are you talking about? That source proves nothing because it's apples to oranges. It doesn't compare at all, because we're talking about Hilchos Shabbos. And by Hilchos Shabbos, anything that removes a splinter's mutter, even if it doesn't have the shame of a kli. Masha'in came, the source that you just quoted is Tuma. Who cares if by Tuma doesn't have the shame of a kli? This isn't about the kli status, it's about removing a splinter. Very good. Says the Gemara, Tuma, 
Why tuma kli ma'isa ba'inam? We need it to be a kli. Linyan Shabbos midi dechazi ba'inam. When it comes to Shabbos, I need, I just need something that's functional to remove the splinter. Ha nami chazia le mishkal abakot. And here, this thing, even though it's missing the eyelid, it still is appropriate to remove a splinter. Oh my Rabbi, I don't agree with you. Uh, Rava says to Abai, man de kamosiv, shafir kamosiv. The question is a really good question. Midila inyan tuma lav manahu, because by the world of tuma, it's not considered a kli. Inyan shabbos, nami lav manahu. Wow, a fundamental machlokas between Abaye and Rava. Do we say that we are allowed to learn Hilchos Shabbos from the world of Tuma Vatara? This requires lamdas, it requires thinking, it requires spending time letting it sink in. Are we allowed to learn Dinim of Shabbos from a realm that has nothing to do with Dinim of Shabbos? How far do we allow extrapolation to go? A great concept to, to think about in general. We don't have time to discuss it here at any length. But suffice it to say that it seems to be that there's a machlokas between Abayi the Rava on this practical point, and there's a practical naf- nafkamina. What's a nafkamina? Whether or not you have a needle where the eyelid broke off, if it's muksa to use on Shabbos to remove a thorn. According to Abaye, it's completely mutter. Because Afal P, that as it relates to Tuma, there's no status of Kli. But we don't care if it has a status of a Kli by Tuma. Tuma a Shabbos karamis. How, how, how can you extrapolate one from the other? Masha'en Kain, Rava says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can learn Helchos Shabbos from the world of Tuma. So that would be enough Kamina between them. Let's continue in the Gemara. We're about nine, ten lines from the bottom. Macy Bay. We have a question that's going to be asked here from a Tosefta. Um, this Tosefta will, was quoted earlier in the Masechta and, uh, and is also found in Masechta's Kalim. Machat ben Nekuva, ben She'ena Nekuva, mutter letaltala b'Shabbos. If you have a needle, whether or not there's an eyelid in the needle, it's permissible to carry on Shabbos. Listen to this language. The low amru nekuva el inyan tuma bilvad. What does that seem like, Abaye? That seems glut like Abaye because what does Abaye say? Who cares about tuma? The only question of the eye that has to do with tuma. I don't care about tuma. I just want to remove the remove the splinter. So this this tosefta poses a big problem for Abaye. In an effort to show tremendous love, Abaye. Sorry. This, this Tosefta provides a challenge against the Shita of Rava, because Rava held that, yes, we learn from Tuma to Shabbos. This Tosefta says, no, we don't, because uh, there's no real reason why we can't. But now answers the Gemara, Abaye, on behalf of Rava, with a tremendous dose of love, Tirgama Abaye, Aliba de Rava, Begolme Askin, and we're talking about in the process when you're making the needle, and you have yet to form out the eyelid. And because zimnin mana, because sometimes people make needles without eyelids, we have them too. You go to a tailor, and he's tailoring your uh, sleeve, he's tailoring whatever. They use needles all the time that don't have eyelids. That's totally fine. That's totally normal. So that's fine. Aval hecha denital charara o upsa. But if it were to have been broken after it was made. Then Adam Zorka Lebain Gerutos, then we would throw it out in the garbage. That's already not viable. That's not something that we would use. Continues the Gemara in a different sugya altogether. Asuve Yanuka. Suve Yanuka is like some intensive physical therapy. Take a look at Rashi. Rashi, two lines from the bottom of the page. Dibur Hamaschel Asuve Yanuka Lahachalik. Seder Evarav, in order to uh, straighten out the limbs of a child, when he's born, Evarav he's spark, and his limbs are all over the place. So sometimes, uh, I guess it could happen that there were people, the babies, when they were born, their limbs were not exactly sitting how they should have been sitting. So, Asuba Yanuka, are you allowed to adjust those limbs on Shabbos? Yes, no? Let's see. Machlok is some right. Rav Nachman Osar, Rav Nachman says you're not allowed to do these types of adjustments. Rav Shesha Shari, Rav Shesha said you are an important Rashi on the bottom. Dibur Hamaskil Osar on the last line. Why does Rav Nachman say Osar, the dummy, the Mesakim, the Dindarapanon? It looks like you're being Mesakim, something looks like you're fixing something. Says the Gemara, second to last line. Amar Rav Nachman, Mina Amina La, what's my Mare Makom, says Rav Nachman, that you are allowed, that you are not allowed to do Asuve Yanuka, you're not allowed to adjust the limbs of this newborn child on Shabbos. Answers the Gemara, it's non, because we have learned 
Ein osin a piktivizin, turning to the top of Kuf Chavkim on the base, we are not allowed to use a piktivizin b'shabes. Take a look at Rashi. What does Rashi say? A piktivizin lehaki. It's a medication that you take to, to force you to induce vomiting. What's really interesting about this word, apiktivizin, is that the name of mo the modern day medica medication that's used to induce vomiting is ipecac. Look at the language here, apiktivizin, apik. Very, very, very similar language. I don't know if the etymology was stolen from here. I don't know which came first, what the core language is. This is not a Hebrew word, obviously, but nevertheless, it is a similar language. So this is the marimakom that Rav Nachman is using to highlight that just like by a piktivizin, by a medication that induces vomiting, that that's not allowed on Shabbos, he equates this with a suve yanuka of, a, of adjusting the limbs. Where Rav Sheshes pushes back and says, what are you talking about? Hasam lav orche. It's not normal for the average adult to drink ipecac, to drink something that's going to force vomiting. However, hacha by a baby orche. Whatever, what, what kind of comparison is that? I don't accept your comparison at all. And then, on top of rejecting his comparison, Rav Sheshis provides his own precedent in halacha as to why it's mutter to do asuve yinuka, why one is allowed to adjust the limbs of a newborn when they're born. Amar Rav Sheshis, mina minala, it's man machat shel ya litol bo it's our Mishnah, that it, it is permissible to remove um, a splinter. And just like his comparison is just like it's permissible to move a splinter on Shabbos, <coughs> so too, it is permissible to do asuve yinuka. Take a look at um, Rashi, the first of the short lines in Rashi. Dibur Hamas v'li tolba esakotz alma tikune gavra b'midi dilav the refua. You're allowed to do things that are not b'shem refua on Shabbos. You're allowed to do these things on Shabbos to leik a mishum shchika samemani because. Since it's not really for refuah purposes, so therefore we don't have the Isr Dirabanan uh, of Shrika Samamanim. The general Isr Dirabanan of Shrika Samamanim is what prevents people from taking medication on Shabbos unless they are actually very sick. I believe it's in Simon Shin Kav Ches. I think it's in Shin Kav Ches and Shulchan Aruch. If we don't take medicine uh, because of Shrika Samamanim, that we're afraid that someone may grind up a pill on Shabbos. Now, in general, unless we have an aversion to swallowing pills whole. We don't grind up pills. Afal Pekin, even though that's the standard that today we don't do that, but we still, the Isra Darabonin remains. And the only time that a person is allowed to take medication when they are a chole, when they're taking something that's for refua, is if they are nafal the if they're sick enough that they need to lie down, or they're chole kol gufo, fine. But says Rav Sheshes, this case of taking out a coat, it's not mutter because of refua. It's just mutter because there's nothing wrong with it. You're allowed to take out a splinter. I, what about bleeding? Do you do a good job of taking out a splinter? Lav dafka that you'll take out any blood at all. And even if you see blood, it would be a davrashen miskav in his mutter. Once you see blood, then you need to stop taking out the splinter because then you're already in the, in the category of psik reshe below yamus. And as we've learned many times, a by the, the rava tarvai, who they both help, psik reshe below yamus, that that would be us or even according to Rav Shimon. And then we cannot rely on davrashen miskav once there's bleeding by a coats. But just to be super clear, it's not mutter to take out a splinter because of refua. It's just not us or to take out a splinter. That's totally permissible. Nothing to worry about at all. So that's the precedent that Rosh Hashish is quoting, that just like, just like by a splinter, it's mutter to remove from one's, from one's skin because it's not refua. so too here by Asuva Yanuka, it's not refua. it's not an illness. It's a kishen that we remove a splinter, so too we remove the, uh, we, we fix the, the body parts of the baby, the Rav Nachman. How does Rav Nachman respond to this? The last line before the Mishnah. Hasam pakid, hachalo pakid. Take a look at Rashi. What does this mean in the Gemara? Rashi, just to the left, a little bit up. Rashi, dibur hamaschil pakid. In regards to the coats, ha coats haze eino mechubar bo. Ela mufkad bin nasun the the, the, uh, the the splinter's external. It doesn't belong in your body. It's a little bit submerged in your skin, but really it's, it doesn't belong there. However, Look, take a look at Rashi's language. Ela mufkad, it's kind of like it's kind of like being stored there. It doesn't belong there. Masha next Rashi. So says the Gemara, beautiful argument against Rav Nach, um, against Rav Sheshis. You want to say that we can make a comparison between removing a splinter and asuve yinuk of adjusting the limbs of a baby because both of them are not refua. Says Rav Nachman, that makes no sense. The splinter is external, doesn't belong in the body. 
But when you're fixing the baby's limbs of an asuba yinuka, they do belong in the body. The cases are not comparable, and that leaves us with the machlokas. And uh, we um, presumably pass in like Roshesh in such a case that when a baby is born, we do anything that is necessary to uh, adjust the health of the baby, even these types of minor adjustments that would be done at birth. Continues the Gemara with the next Mishnah. We'll be heading down to the uh, uh, fourth to last line on the page tonight, so just a few more minutes until we wrap up. You have a piece of wood from an olive tree. If there's a knot of wood, a knot in the wood at the end of the wood, at the end of this cane, then because it has a, its own function to it, as we'll see soon in the Gemara. So then, because it has its own function, so therefore it's makabal tuma v'imlab. If it doesn't have a knot in the end of the wood, then in makabal tuma, then this utensil has no status of a cleat. But benkach or benkach nitel b'shabes. However, it has a use on Shabbos and that it can be used as a cane. Uh, so it may not have a status of a cleat proper, but it, it does have a function of some kind. Amai asks the Gemara. Amai, why would it be that this piece of wood, even with the knot on the end, is considered a cleat at all? It's pshute kli eitzu. It's just a regular piece of wood. There's nothing. It's not a kli eitz that that it has a kli kibul. It's not like a bowl. What is it? What bichlal? It doesn't mean anything. Pshute kli eitz enon. Uh, and tuma. As a general rule, we say that regular pieces of wood, you go outside, you have a piece of lumber sitting outside, it's pshute kli eitz. It's not a kli. It doesn't have the status of kli. Why not? Because my time, well, what's the reason why? Because dumya desak ba'ina. We learned this pasuk already, uh, previously in the Masechta. What daf was that on? On daf pei gimel. We learned that there's a comparison between wood and sackcloth. The sackcloth is only deemed to be a ba- is only deemed to be a kli when it can hold something. When it has the din of of, a, of like a bag of some kind, that's when it has the din. That's when it has the status of a kli. What about wood? Same. It has to match the suck, the sackcloth, and that it's able to carry something. But a regular piece of wood that can't carry anything. So why, even if there's a kesher on the end of the wood, even if the wood has a knot in its end, why then would we then con- consider it to be a kli? After all, we need dumyut the suck, but you know, in this case, it doesn't apply. Answers the Gemara. Because that kesher, the knot in the wood, we use as an indicator of oil when it's being used uh, in regards to zesim, in regards to the, if you're looking, using it in an olive press, you can kind of press in, and then when you turn it over and look at the bottom of the wood, you can tell in the kesher what uh, quality of oil you have. Very good. That brings us to our next Mishnah. Rabbi Yossi, Omer, Kol HaKelim, Nitlin, all utensils can be carried, chutz min ha-meser ha-gadol, except for a very uh, large uh, saw, uh, the Yosei Shal Macharisha, or one of those hooks, one of the, uh, I guess like a blade, or like the part of the plow that actually digs into the ground that, and makes the furrow. So these images of an animal pull, pulling a multi-furrowed device on its back, and when it pulls, it leaves a furrow. So that sharp thing, so you can carry anything you want on Shabbos, seemingly from the Mishnah, just not things that have no other purpose, such as the Meser Hagadal and the Yosef Shal Macharish. Says the Gemara, there are other things that have a use that are that are completely useless on Shabbos. What are they? Amar Rav Nachman, Hai Uchla de a certain item that was used by someone who does laundry. He's Ki Yosef Shal Macharish That's similar to this thing that which, which will never be mutter to carry on Shabbos. Amar Rabbi, Charva de Oshrefi. The blade or the sword of someone who's an ushchafi, we saw this word earlier in the Masechta, a tanner. The sakina de ashkavta, the knife that's used by a butcher, again, like a, a, a cleaver type of meat, uh, of knife that's used only under specific circumstances. The chatsina de nagre, a particular device that was used by those who were woodworkers. All of those are kiyase shal macharisha dami. The Gemara here is just expanding with whatever the tools were of the day of things that have absolutely no purpose whatsoever on Shabbos, none at all. Okay, very good, let's continue. Tanu Rabbanon, we now need to learn a little bit of history and an unfortunate one at that. Virishona, during the early times of the Jews, we'll see when this was uh, in a little bit. Hayu Omrim, they were, uh, they, they said, and this was on the good side of the coin, early on they said, Shlosha Kalim Nitlin B'Shabbos, uh, sorry, it's on the bad side of things. Only three types of utensils were allowed. 
uh, to be moved on Shabbos. Why were we so limited? Because uh, they, were not, they were not keeping Shabbos properly, as we're going to see was true in the times of Nehemiah, still in the times of Tanakh, before, the, before Tanakh was canonized. We're already going way back in history. This is not the times of the Amorim and the Tanaim. This is before that. At that time, there was a concern that people were not keeping Shabbos properly. So the Chachamim had to put an injunction in. They had to put in a stopgap to make sure that people were not going to violate halacha even more. So they made the halachas of uh, muksa very strict. And they only allowed for three things. They allowed the mikzoa shel dvela, a knife to cut certain foods. The zuama a listron shel kadeira. They used to allow a certain ladle to scoop out food. The sakin ketana shel gabi The regular table knife was permissible as well. And then after that point in history, and this is where things get critical, Itiru, they allowed one thing, and then Vichazru Bihitiru, they went back and allowed another thing, two, and then Vichazru Bihitiru, they allowed a third thing. Ad Amru, until they got to the point where they said, our Mishnah, So now the Gemara t- paints this, this little history. <coughs> The Lord paints this little history of three layers in which the Jewish people were given back some of their freedoms from rabbinic injunction as they improved in their Shemirah Shabbos. So what were these three layers? How, how did it play out? Says the Gemara, last of the short lines, halfway down, Kufchav Kimel on the face. Mai hitiru v'chazru, hitiru v'chazru, hitiru. What were these three leniencies that were allowed after the tightening of restrictions, which only at that time allowed three things to be carried on Shabbos? Amar here were the layers. Number one. They allowed a kli that otherwise was permissible to use on Shabbos prior to these restrictions, and now it could be used with Tzorach Gufo for its own purpose. And that's number one. Number two, another uh, item that was, again, that same item, we already said it was Mutzah L'Tzorach Gufo, now we're allowing it L'Tzorach Makomo. Fine, very good. And then the third one is, Vechazer but only L'Tzorach Gufo in, but L'Tzorach Makomo lo. So Abaye says that these were the three layers, the two parts of Dabr Shemalachto le Heter, and one part, a Tzorach Gufo of Kli Shemalachto le Iser. Um, and then says the Gemara about Dayin, and it was still the case that the Yodo Achas in Bishta Yodav Lo, that one was allowed to only carry items that they could carry in one hand, but not two. Uh, and then finally, finally, they developed enough in their Shemir Shabbos, so they got to our Mishnah, just like it says in our Mishnah that you can now carry utensils on Shabbos even with larger items that require to be carried with two hands. I don't understand something that you said, Abaye. You made a very strange distinction. What was the distinction that you made two-thirds of the way down? It says that they permitted it. Abaye, you made the distinction between Tzorach Gufo and Tzorach Makomo. The Gemara doesn't make that distinction. The Tanaim didn't, Nehemiah didn't make that distinction. Why are you making the distinction? It says Itiru. It doesn't say Itiru the Tzorach Gufo only and not Tzorach Makomo. How did you get to make that decision? It's very strange. There's no, nothing, nothing as a precedent. Rava. Rava says, no, this is the history of how they began to release those rabbinic injunctions to provide more leniency to the Jewish people as their Shmira Shabbos improved. Number one, what was number one and two for Abaye is number one for Rava. That is, that which is a klisha malachto leheter, in one uh, fell swoop, they allowed letzorach kufo letzorach makomo for those items. Number two, they also allowed under certain circumstances to bring something from the, from the sun into the shade so that the item would not get ruined. So when it comes to a Dabr Shemalachto Leheter, the first two, the first item allowed Tzorach Lugufo Tzorach Makomo, the second Heter allowed that Dabr Shemalachto Leheter in regards to moving it from the sun to the shade to protect it. And the third one, as we see here, is Chazru Behitiru Davar Shemalachto Leisro Letzorach Kufa Letzorach Makomo in Pamecham Aletzeilo. When it comes to a Klisha Malachto Leisro, we do allow its use for either its direct purpose, namely, for example, a hammer to be used. That's Letzorach Kufa. Letzorach Makomo is I need the space where the hammer is. It's sitting on my dining room table, and I need to set the table. You can move it, but Mecham Aletzeilo. Low. You cannot move something for its sake. I can't move the hammer because I'm afraid that the sun's going to beat down on the wood and the wood might warp. 
That's not allowed. The Sorach Gufo, it's being used for a specific purpose. The Sorach Makoma, or I need what there, where, where this item has its space. And then, Be'adayin says Rava, Be'adayin b'shnei b'nei Adam, uh, sorry, Be'adayin b'adam echad in, only something that one person could carry, b'shnei b'nei Adam lo, something that's large enough for two people to carry, that would not be allowed. Uh, Sha'amar, then they got to our Mishnah. Uh, this is like a beautiful, robust explanation of the history that leads to our Mishnah. Our Mishnah is an afterthought on all of this history. Uh, Sha'amar, until uh, our Mishnah says, Kol HaKelem Nitlin B'Shabbos, Afilu B'Shnei B'nei Adam, even if it's something large enough that two people need to carry, asks the Gemara, five, six, seven lines from the bottom, Eisi Be'ya Ba'i Meducha, Im Yesh Ba Mishum Metaltalin, Im Yesh Ba Shum, if there's garlic on the Meducha, this uh, this uh, utensil upon which we crush things, if there's garlic on it, metaltalinoso. Beam lav in metaltalinoso. If not, you're not, then you're not allowed to carry it. Ask the Gemara, Rafa, against Rafa, why not? You just said it's mutter. Manavshacha should be mutter. Either it's a klisha malachto le heter and it's mutter, or it's a klisha malachto le iser and it's mutter. And even if you want to argue that it's big, you just said that two people are allowed to carry muksa. So on, on a whole bunch of levels, Rafa, you got to answer the question. What were we talking about? We know, of course, that a maduch is a klisha malach to le'isr. So what was the scenario where even Rava would say it's not allowed? Like we just learned. Mechama letzel. When it comes to a klisha malach to le'isr, it must be either letzorach kufa or letzorach makomo, but not if it's mechama letzel. You're not allowed to move the item from the sun to the shade to protect the item. It can only be moved for something that it needs to be used for or for the space underneath it, otherwise not allowed. Next question, AC baby shoven, shin katsavalov basar sha asar letaltalo. Like we learned on the previous Amud, there was a, a type of cutting block that was used to cut meat. So there too, we should say that it's mutter according to Rabba. Why can't we move it? Manushach. If it's a klisha malachta le iser, it should be mutter bein le tzorch kufa le tzorch makomo. Answers the Gemara. Same answer as before. Hachanami, hachanami mechama le tzel. There too, the reason why you're not allowed to move it is not because it's a klisha malachta le iser. Rava holds its mutter to move a klisha malach to leser. Even if it's too heavy for one person to carry its mutter, provided that it's a sarach kufa letzorach makomo. If you need for the item for itself, or if you need the item for its space, but to move it for its own benefit because you don't want the sun to beat down on it is not allowed. Last line of the Gemara for the night. Amar of Chanino, when did all of this take place? This din that we are learning, our Mishnah, was taught in the times of Nehemia. This is when the Jews were struggling and then began to grow after the injunctions of the Chachamim were put in. The Chachamim used their tremendous wisdom and siyat and yishmaya to come up with a very strict list, as we saw, of only three things that were mutter, these knives that were permissible to use. Those were the only things that were mutter until the Jews began to improve. Once they began to improve, Baruch Hashem, once they began to improve, those injunctions were removed until that led to our Mishnah with all the leniencies that we know of. And we talk a paskin like Rava, that a klisha malach to le'isr, the tzorach gufo or the tzorach makomo is, mis- is mutter to you. So the hammer is a great example. A pen is a great example. Let's say you need a pen to, uh, I don't know, your pen to, uh, you, I don't know, something that's mutter to do with a pen that you're not, not ready. You need to move something else. You need to use it to wet, to unwedge something that's stuck from uh, in the back of a chair, whatever it is. Mutter v'mutter v'mutter. You can't write with it. That's mama shasar. But to you, the tzorach kufa, the tzorach makomo, that's permissible. But even Rabbi, who's lenient in regards to, to a klisha malach, the tzorach kufa, the tzorach makomo, would not allow that to be moved for its own benefit. Only the tzorach kufa or the tzorach makomo will stop here. Wishing you all a beautiful night. If you have yet to donate to uh, the charity campaign of Makor HaChayim, you have, I think, six minutes to do so. Wishing you all a beautiful night. Thank you so much for joining in the have a great night.